Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes, great. Thank you for being here. My name is Stephanie Markin. I'm Executive Director of Education Research here at Gallup. I'm gonna be getting us started this morning. Um, I'm gonna kick us off with some insights from the most recent study that we conducted with Western Governors University about their alumni outcomes from our most recent survey. That report will be made available after this presentation, so feel free to just pick up a copy on your way out. Um, and then we'll transition over to Scott Pulsifer, WGU's president, who will give a very quick synopsis of the latest and greatest news, events, and research happening at WGU. And then we'll transition to our panel of folks who will dive more deeply into the insights in the report, and then also importantly, the implications for higher education more generally. So I have had the pleasure of working with the WGU team now for four years since we first started this partnership in measuring alumni outcomes um, among their very large, robust group of alumni across all of their different programs. I'm gonna focus on a series of the outcomes that we've concentrated on over the course of the last four years. Importantly, workforce outcomes is among them. And that's been an important focus of Gallup's in all of our research with more than 75,000 college graduates to date through our national Gallup alumni survey, formerly the Gallup Purdue Index, where we've interviewed graduates about their collegiate experience, and then importantly, what life looks like after college for those folks, to understand what are the key collegiate experiences that best prepare graduates for success upon graduation in two critical areas, importantly, their jobs and then also their lives. What we find in all of our research is the main outcome for a college degree for the vast majority of those who seek higher education in the first place is a great job. 88% of incoming freshmen in a recent UCLA CERT poll report that that is the main reason they went to college in the first place. And we see similar findings in our Strata Education Network Education Consumer Survey. So there are several ways in which we measure the extent to which these graduates got a good job upon graduation. Importantly, we ask individuals the extent to which they're just employed for an employer, part-time, full-time for themselves, or not in the workforce in the, in the first place. What we find with WGU alumni who we've interviewed is consistently of the vast majority are employed for an employer. So 79% of graduates who we interviewed in this most recent administration reported that they were employed for an employer. This compares to the following peer groups that we've listed here, and you'll see them throughout the presentation. So these peer groups come from our nationally representative study, the Strata Gallup Alumni Survey, now just Gallup Alumni Survey, for which we've been interviewing those 75,000 college graduates. So we have a nationally representative benchmark of what some of these outcomes look like throughout the US for all college graduates, and then for several other peer groups of interest here. Importantly, those who graduate from public colleges, private not-for-profit institutions, for-profit institutions, and then importantly, non-traditional college graduates. And we operationalize that as people who obtain their degree at age 25 or older. So when we look at those peer groups, what we find consistently is WGU graduates are more likely to be employed for an employer. When we compare it to the national alumni database that we have, we see about 72% of college graduates throughout the US are employed for an employer. The other numbers are similarly set, with the lowest being among those non-traditional age students, which we find are employed at 63% for an employer. Now, to us at Gallup, employment is not the ultimate outcome, although obviously it's a very important one for our graduates. We believe that real fulfillment in one's work comes from engagement in their work. And we measure engagement through a series of questions that we call the Gallup Q12. And those items are meant to design the extent to which somebody is engaged in their work. And an engaged person is somebody who finds incredible fulfillment and derives real value from their work. So they're emotionally and psychologically committed to that work. It's not just that they're making a lot of money, although that's not a bad thing. More importantly, they find mission and purpose in their work. And what we find in WGU graduates is a slightly higher percentage of those graduates are engaged and emotionally connected to their work, 44%. This has huge implications from employers as well because what we find in our research is those who are more engaged actually cost their employer far less in terms of things like healthcare costs, absenteeism, turnover rates. They're also far more likely to re recommend their organization as a place to work, which is obviously incredibly important, especially in this low unemployment rate that we have nationally. What we saw throughout the rest of our database is that essentially 37% of graduates are engaged in their work. Those are four-year degree holders, so four-year or higher. Slightly smaller percentage of non-traditional graduates were engaged in their work at about 36% of the total population. We also ask a series of questions about how relevant their work was to their current job. Um, relevancy has been a real focus um, throughout our higher education practice because what we find is if somebody experienced curriculum in their post-secondary experience that was highly relevant to the current work that they do, 
They're far more likely to recommend that university to a friend or family member. They're far more likely to believe their degree was valuable and worth the cost and investment. So it's an incredibly important outcome for our university partners. And in this case, we saw that 73% of our WGU graduates reported that their curriculum was completely related to the current work that they were doing. Now, some of them enroll far later in life and have a much more intentional design about how they will go about their postgraduate degree experience. But what we find is this is even far greater than other non-traditional graduates nationally um, at 43%, and also much higher than the other populations that we studied, including college graduates nationally, which were at just 42%. Now what we find is employee engagement is also higher among those who report that their current work is highly relevant um, to the curriculum that they studied. So again, engagement is much more important in this case. Now as I mentioned, we look at two important facets of one's experience post-graduation. The first one is their jobs and workforce related outcomes. The second one is their lives. And we measure their lives through a series of questions that we ask about well-being specifically. And we have studied well-being now globally for more than a decade. We have interviewed millions of people about the extent to which they're thriving, struggling, or suffering in each of these various elements of their lives. And these elements are incredibly interrelated. So the extent to which somebody is thriving, for example, in their financial well-being has a huge impact in other areas of their lives. So the five elements are career, social, financial, community, and physical well-being. Career is exactly what you think it is. It's finding mission, purpose, and value in your work for those who are employed. Social well-being is all about having the relationships in your lives that you can turn to people in a time of need and having that social support and network. Financial well-being isn't about how much money you make, importantly. It's about how you're able to manage your financial stress. And then community well-being is feeling a sense of belonging and ownership in one's community in which they live. And then finally, physical well-being is exactly what you think it is. It's about having enough energy to do the things that you want to do on a daily basis. In the case of our WGU graduates, we found across the board they were consistently higher than our comparison points, importantly in the area of career and financial well-being. And I think there are a lot of hypotheses from the report that you'll see here shortly about why that might be the case, particularly in the case of financial well-being, um, which we see is hugely impacted by student loan debt levels. What we'll see, you'll see in the report is that WGU graduates loaned about half the national average to obtain their degree. And so we hypothesize that much of what you're seeing in that area of financial well-being is tied to the total investment that they made in their education. So in addition to these important long-term and short-term outcomes, we also ask graduates a series of questions about their collegiate experience, their practical experiences and interactions with faculty and staff members, who work at the university. And these data, again, come from that national database for which we have comparison groups. And there are two questions in particular that we use to measure um, the extent to which they had mentors and on-the-job learning experiences. The first says, I had a mentor who encouraged me to pursue my goals and dreams. We asked this nationally, what we see is about a third of college graduates nationally report having a mentor who encouraged them to pursue their goals and dreams. And this mentor can be anybody that they come into contact while enrolled. So for some people, it's an extracurricular advisor. For some people, it's a faculty member, a staff member. In some cases, it's even a peer that they interact with through their coursework. In the case of WGU alumni, we see a far higher percentage, a 67% strongly agreed that they had that mentor. Now, why does mentorship matter? Well, for a variety of reasons, one of which is we find that those who have a mentor who encourage them to pursue their goals and dreams actually stay in contact with that mentor long into life upon graduation. These are some of the strongest relationships that graduates report having long into their career. Also importantly, if you had a mentor who encouraged you to pursue your goals and dreams, we know from our national research that you're far more likely to be engaged in your job upon graduation and far more likely to be thriving in your well-being upon graduation. So important long-term Im implications on the issue of mentorship. We also ask a question about having a job or an internship while you were enrolled that allowed you to apply what you were learning in the classroom. Because we find for many that the learning process is just enhanced when they're able to take that coursework and apply it in a real-world setting. This has been a real core item for which we've measured nationally with those 75,000 college graduates. And again, we find that if you had that applied job or internship, you're far better off upon graduation. So in that case, we see that 81% of WGU alumni strongly agree that they had that job or internship. For many, it's actually a full-time job and not an internship experience, which we see is more typical among other college graduates that we interview. And that compares with 58% of college graduates nationally, and potentially a more appropriate comparison point, about half of non-traditional college graduates. 
So we've asked this question for several years, this question around believing your degree was worth the cost. This has been a real focus of ours. And cost means a lot of things to a lot of different people. For some, it's just the financial investment they make. For many, it's also the opportunity cost of re-enrolling, taking time out of your career and your life to obtain this additional degree. So we specifically say cost for good reason in that item. And the item is exactly this, on a five-point scale, where one means you strongly disagree and five means you strongly agree, to what extent do you believe your degree was worth the cost from X institution? And what we saw was 72% of WGU graduates strongly agreed with the statement. And you'll see, again, the comparison is very stark um, when you compare that to national metrics for the currently enrolled and graduate population. And the reason we believe is this, is we see that there's a huge relationship between believing your degree was worth the cost and your total student loan debt levels upon graduation. And given the significant delta that we saw between loan debt levels for WGU graduates and that for the national population, we would anticipate and hypothesize that's likely what we're seeing in this data point. We also saw similarly that WGU graduates were far more likely to recommend their university to friends or family members on this 10 point scale that we ask. They're far more likely to report that they are extremely likely to recommend the university than our other college graduate groups at 39% nationally. We also measure several areas of emotional attachment with our graduate population. These are items that really um, give much more detail and context about the emotional attachment, affection, and affinity that somebody has for their alma mater. And here we saw that about 72% of WGU graduates reported that the school was the perfect place for people like them. And that can be compared with 36% of college graduates nationally. So a tremendous difference between those two populations in particular. We also ask a question that says, I can't imagine a world without my university. And we see that 37% of WGU graduates strongly agreed with that statement compared to 30% of college graduates nationally. Now these items are important for a series of reasons. Every university wants to be the perfect place for their specific student population. Importantly, we also see that if you strongly agree with these statements, you're far more likely to donate back to the university and to be an active alumni for your university. So I'll just give you some brief um, mentions on the methodology because the data is the fun part and the important part. And it's important to note the rigorous methodology in which we do engage in to do all of this research. So this research came with a web-based methodology. So we interview all of our college graduates with a web-based methodology because we find we get much higher response rates with them via that approach. We interviewed just 2,400 WGU graduates, which is consistent with our typical methodology in the first three years of this study. We sent a series of email invitations and multiple non-response reminders to encourage those non-respondents, which is why you should always answer a pollster the first time. And we conducted the survey over a several week period to make sure that we could get as many responses as possible. And again, those comparison points that I mentioned come from our national research, formerly the Gallup Purdue Index, now the Gallup Alumni Survey. So with that, I will wrap it up and turn it over to Scott, who will walk us through some of the latest and greatest news and events from WGU. I think the, there we go, um, and I tend to be a walker too. So that's the thing. Um, I'm going to just uh, provide a brief kind of drive-by intro of uh, it is it, it's this mic. Apparently. <laughs> okay, I'll stand right here. No, that's okay. Um, and so uh, I'll just provide a, a brief kind of intro to WGU, so you can have a sense of uh, of what really is at our core uh, and how we how we do what we do. Um, WGU was founded just over 22 years ago by uh, some really innovative governors of 19 Western states, Had, hence the, the name. The Western Governors University truly has that heritage of having been founded by the governors of 19 Western states. And they were, they were looking to solve a very simple and fundamental problem, which is they had a large portion of their residents of their respective states for whom their public university systems and the options that were available to those adults were not really meeting their needs. And they realized that this was also a large portion of their workforce that wasn't fully enabled for where their economies were going. And so they endeavored to kind of reinvent the institution entirely centered around the student. Um, today, as you can see, uh, WGU serves uh, over 116,000 full-time students. We have those students in all 50 states across the US. There are as many states that are in the east as there are in the west. Uh, those students also, you can see, are pursuing degrees, bachelor's and master's degrees, in four different areas that we focused on to this point. Uh, and that has been in the College of Health, College of Business, College of Technology, and College of Teachers, College of Teaching. 
Um, you'll note uh, in our history, the Teachers College itself was actually founded by a $10 million grant from the Department of Education about 15 years ago to establish a national teachers college. WGU today is the only, college, uh, only university that licenses teachers in all 50 states across the US. Um, we have over 25,000 enrolled students in our teachers college alone. And uh, so you can kind of get a sense as to how we think uh, at WGU is that we know that we were founded by states for states as we endeavor to ensure that we are providing access to high quality education, particularly among the underserved. That also is the surest path to opportunity that it works and it works really well. Today, if you just looked at the profile of our students by colleges, uh, by college, this is what we uh, uh, have as graduates. This is cumulative graduates. You saw on the prior slide that we have cumulative graduates to date of uh, over 140,000 graduates. Uh, you can see here 35,000 that teach college, uh, the, the uh, business college of nearly 40,000. Our largest is health professions. The primary program there is actually the RN to BSN program. That is the largest nursing program across the country for RNs who need to actually get uh, their bachelor's degree to continue in their path in their career. And then our youngest and kind of newest college is the College of Information Technology, but that college in terms of enrollment is currently growing at about 35 to 40 percent year over year. And that's true for the last two years. Uh, just to give you a sense of the demand that's around uh, the information technology area, we introduced our Bachelor's of Computer Science in June of last year. Uh, we already have nearly 4,000 students enrolled in that program alone. Uh, similarly, in, in cybersecurity, we've twice in a row now been recognized as the academia partner by the EC Council, which is the largest cybersecurity uh, consortium across the globe. Uh, we introduced our Bachelor's of Cybersecurity uh, two years ago, and I think the enrollment in that is over 5,000 students as well in that program. And so we have the ability to really scale up the programs to meet the workforce needs really quickly. You can see here that our average age uh, is uh, 36 years old. Our fastest growing uh, age demographic, though, is in the traditional age population as well, the 17 to 24 year olds. We do believe in our design that actually serves all types of individuals and adults. Um, and at the center, again, of everything that we do at WGU is the student. We believe that everything from the curriculum to the faculty engagement to the technology-enabled learning model, everything is actually designed so that every single student feels like the whole of the university is designed exclusively for them, for that one individual. And if we can work specifically for that one individual, we'll dramatically increase the probability that they can attain their credential so that they ultimately are going to be on that path to opportunity, which is what the focus of the Gallup survey is. Uh, let me just give you kind of a, uh, our belief is that uh, having reinvented the institution around a mission of simply you know, improving quality, expanding access, and optimized outcomes, this is what we believe, uh, that you actually focus the quality around the curriculum. Uh, we make sure that we design all of our curriculum to align with the market and workforce needs. In the competency-based model itself, it allows you to go away from courses and down to very granular design of learning outcomes that map directly to competencies that are required in the workforce, not just today, but also tomorrow. And so that market alignment of the learning to the, out, uh, to the workforce has been very relevant. You can see that in some of the Gallup surveys around it was directly relevant to the job that I'm pursuing or the job and career that I'm pursuing. We also reinvented or at least advanced significantly the pedagogical model around competency-based education. This allows both the, for the personalization of the learning as well as the granular design of the curriculum. What you'll notice with competency-based education, too, it allows individuals to go at the pace that they learn, and you let time be the variable. Lastly, we have uh, redesigned a faculty model. So instead of having a single faculty for every course, we actually unbundled that faculty role into four different faculty types. There are those that design and develop the curriculum. Then there are three teaching faculty. We have faculty program mentors. These are the individuals who are dedicated to every single new student who starts and they effectively stay with them through their entire program until they graduate. During the course of their program, students will also interact with course faculty, teacher and subject matter experts in the specific courses, and then we separately have evaluation faculty who assess the learning outcomes of students. You'll note in the competency-based design, those who design the curriculum faculty are different from those who teach the curriculum, are different from those who evaluate student performance against those assessed outcomes. From an expanding access standpoint, you'll realize that uh, we leverage the internet. We have no campuses. Uh, we deliver everything in a virtual context, including all that faculty engagement, all the learning resources, all the personalized uh, technology uh, roadmap, if you will, that a student goes through. What we also recognize is that you can expand access by making it highly affordable. 
And it becomes much more affordable for two reasons. One is we have a flat subscription-based tuition for a six-month period, during which students can learn as much as they are able. So regardless of how many credits you're completing, if you will, you do not pay more for that six-month term. That actually accelerates the time that students can complete a degree. So on average, our students are completing their bachelor's degree in two, two and a half years, two years and four months is our most recent data, which then the total cost of completing your bachelor's degree at WGU is about sixteen to $17,000. And of course, throughout that journey, we leverage technology heavily. And then we, of course, focus on outcomes. Uh, Gallup today is one of those things that we are clearly focused on. It's not just about whether our students are actually progressing at the pace that's relevant for them, but ultimately, are, are the students that are graduating, are they achieving ultimately the return that they expect for the investment that they made in their education with WGU? And so you can see some of the outcomes there. And it's not, by the way, just about getting a job or just about getting income. You can also see we obsess about things like overall well-being. We obsess about you know, the experience that they're having. Are they really satisfied with that experience? We also focus on employers and what do employers feel about the quality and readiness of the graduates that are coming out of WGU. And so we, we generally love to basically prove the innovation that is happening in WGU by focusing on the outcomes. <laughs> Lastly, let me just share with you some of the exciting things that we believe are occurring at WGU. Um, today, we are launching WGU Academy. We announced this two weeks ago, but it go li goes live today as students are first time enrolling in the Academy. The Academy is focused specifically on increasing the personalization of on-ramps to post-secondary credentials. So it's focusing on those individuals who've had no prior college, may have had some prior college, have never actually had any experience in post-secondary education, and it readies them for success in, that, in their pursuit of that credential. This specifically is focusing on other things that are related to social-emotional learning as well to increase the self-efficacy and the communication abilities and learning how to learn those aspects that we've seen and identified as being critical to student success in their program once they join in that program. We believe this is a critical aspect to specifically advance our endeavors around expanding access, that those individuals now can be better readied for success in their post-secondary education. We also have uh, recently, well, in the last year, launched, launched our Center for Applied Learning Science. This specifically allows us to expand the aperture of innovation around learning and learning design, around readiness, around curriculum development, you name it. We partner with a number of other institutions across the space in, in the higher ed sector to ensure that we are continuing to advance those innovations that can have a large-scale student impact. Lastly, we're kind of on 3.0 version of our responsible borrowing initiative in this regard. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of this, uh, you know, we already have a very affordable cost, but we also believe that if you give individuals better information about the funding options they're gonna pursue, that they'll actually make better choices. So five years ago, we introduced version one of responsible borrowing, and for our own graduates, we've reduced debt per graduate from over $21,000 five years ago to now it's about $15,300 per graduate. We actually see that still going down and hopefully getting down to sub about $12,000 per graduate. During that same time period, you've seen what happened in the industry generally is that debt per graduate keeps going up. But even for a very low cost, affordable one like WGU, we can also help students take less debt to increase their overall affordability. Today, we're giving them even better information about what's the total cost of funding options, how does that change based upon the pace you're actually completing your program, what is the total lifetime cost of funding or financing that debt that you're taking on, et cetera. We're also expanding options around scholarships and grants, et cetera, that are available to students so they can continue to reduce the funding needed to complete their degree with WGU. Um, we're also very excited about something that we announced uh, two weeks ago. Uh, in partnership with the uh, Service Employees International Union and the United Health Workers West, the, the labor union out in, in California, as well as 15 employer partners and their education fund, WGU is specifically partnered to address a 400,000 workforce gap specifically in allied health. This will allow us, from a competency-based design, to specifically introduce sub-degree credentials that become stackable into degree pathways. Our first pilot that's live is with uh, medical coding, and we're pursuing additional things around medical assistant and other uh, sub-degree programs, but the whole point of this is specifically addressing a very large-scale 400,000 identified workforce gap in California, working with labor, unions, uh, labor union as well as uh, employer partners, but building a full you know, learning traverse, if you will, with stackability of those credentials so that now individuals can have a lifelong uh, provident life, if you will, within the healthcare space. We're very excited about this. We think that the industry alignment uh, is going to be very strong, not just in healthcare, but we see it also in technology and business and other sectors as well across the country. 
So we hope uh, that uh, it gives you a sense of how WGU continues to endeavor to advance the value of higher education for the students we serve. And, and with that, I'll turn the time back to Stephanie. Don't know if there's there we go. Great. So I'm going to kick off our great panel then. You actually have full bios for all these people at your seats, so I'll just uh, read their name and ask them to take the stage, and we'll transition to that portion of the morning. After the, panels, um, the panel discussion, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers for about 15 to 20 minutes, so please feel free to jot down anything that you'd like to hear any of these folks talk about. Um, so I'll start off with Scott Pulsfer, president of Western Governors University. Um, we also importantly have a member of the media here from Inside Higher Ed, Paul Fain, who's an editor at Inside Higher Ed. And then lastly, Johnny Taylor, who's president and CEO of SHRM. So representing all of our different areas, importantly workforce with Johnny. Thanks so much. All right, so I'm gonna kick off with an easy question. Um, maybe we'll start with Johnny. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. You've obviously read the report, which these folks have not yet seen, but we'll see shortly. What was the most interesting data point or finding from where you sit outside of academia, but obviously being very intimately familiar with academia? I hate to be forced to pick one. Okay, but, you can have more um, than one. I'll cheat. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hold to this. It was the fact that 72% of WGE graduates uh, strongly agree that their education was worth the cost. And as someone, Sharm, for you, you don't know, we have 310,000 members across the globe, uh, HR professionals, so we are the first line uh, that we interact with candidates and ultimately employees to and through their employment experience. And consistently, we hear what I call a, 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 almost a resentment from a number of our applicants uh, with regard to their school experience. They come in and I'm way in debt, uh, so I'm sort of pissed to start, you know, I got $100,000 worth of debt. You hear the $30,000 number, but that's the average. It is not at all unusual to see someone sitting before you with six figures of student loan debt. So they're sort of frustrated, they feel betrayed by their institutions, et cetera. But what's really interesting is when you see a $100,000 uh, debt person who's very happy with their work and you ask them why, they say, it's not how much I took out, it's did it re result in a good job. So I can service the debt, then I'm fine, because I knowingly assume the debt. But ultimately, what we hear a lot from our members, all 310,000 of them, is that it ultimately, we're not convinced that it was worth the cost. So I'm shocked to see 72%, yeah. three and four graduates of any institution, that's Harvard down, who say it was worth it. Great, thanks. Paul, same question to you. Sure, well, I'm, I'm kind of relieved. When you said 72%, I thought you were picking the one I was gonna pick, but it's a, <laughs> it's a different 72%. Different 72%. Percent. Yeah. Uh, you know, it seems kind of counterintuitive when you think about one of the largest universities in, in the country relying in part on word of mouth, but the 72% saying they were extremely likely to recommend their alma mater seems really striking, especially when the rest of the academy was in the 30s and 40s percentile. Um, and you know, uh, when you think about the increasing data that we have about the disadvantage that first generation college students have because as they are considering whether to embark on an extremely labor intensive and expensive venture of pursuing post-secondary credential, they don't have the experience at home to, to lean on for some confidence about making the leap and the fact that WGU has built this word of mouth endorsement on, uh, with a very large student population. Seems like a pretty power, powerful data point. Awesome, thanks. I know it's all interesting to you, Scott, from where you sit, but what's your most interesting finding? Um, I think to pivot off a little bit of what Paul was sharing here is that uh, that 72% uh, that they are highly likely to recommend WGU, that does actually translate into, into real impact uh, because from last year, we have the data that 68% of our new students who enrolled last year were actually referred to WGU. Um, there's uh, benefits to the institution for that reason too, because we have a much lower cost of acquisition as a result. Um, uh, now, having said that, it, you'll note that uh, WGU also has about half the awareness of some of the peer institutions that exist out there. 
but, but maybe over time the affinity in that network of 140,000 alumni growing at nearly 35,000 graduates this year, like that affinity network may continue to expand the awareness, but uh, we're quite pleased with the fact that, uh, that graduates and students tend to refer a lot of their friends and colleagues. Employers who are very satisfied with our graduates also tend to refer a lot of their employees to WGU. And then also our community college partnerships are very relevant to that uh, referral. And, um, and you know, I think the key point of, of that is to simply that we feel some degree of satisfaction that uh, we are delivering real value for the individuals that we serve and that the promise of higher education as the surest path to opportunity is being realized for them. And that feels very satisfying. Awesome. Paul, I'll turn back to you because much of the research and the report and the research that we've done nationally has really demonstrated the significant impact of student debt on one's perception that their degree was valuable, but also importantly on each element of well-being, um, from purpose well-being all through physical well-being. Curious, obviously there's much talk about accessibility and affordability in this greater higher education landscape, but maybe you can ground us in some recent thoughts around policies that are being um, suggested nationally and otherwise around this issue of accessibility and affordability from where you sit. Sure, do you mind if I take it back a little yeah. bit? Yeah, yeah. so you know, I, um, I started covering higher ed before the Great Recession, and I can tell you it was a very different beat back then. Uh, wasn't as interesting. Um, <laughs> to be honest. And you know, I had some awareness of what WGU was building, but uh, if you had asked me in 2004, it, it would have been, I wouldn't have had a very good way to explain it because it's really quite different. It really is a pretty unique model. Um, anyhow, uh, after the recession hit, we saw the rise and collapse, really, of the large for-profits. Um, and I think people are just kind of recognizing that the degree issuing for-profit chain is pretty much gone. And there's a few left, but not much. Um, so major you know, tectonic shift in the way that higher ed sought to reach out to working adults and, and better serve them, um, where a sector really moved there first. There were others, um, but then grew too fast. And depending on your perspective, things happened that weren't great and uh, is collapsing now. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, I probably wrote the phrase competency-based education more than any other journalist. And, uh, you know, now I think a lot of my peers are like, well, you know, CBE is kind of like the MOOCs, right? You know, it was a big, a big hype, and then it kind of went away. You know, it didn't grow as fast as people thought. Well, first of all, the MOOCs are back. <laughs> Coursera just got $100 million um, and is doing a lot of exciting stuff. But, you know, um, CBE, with one major exception on this stage, has grown relatively slowly. And you know, there's a really interesting study we wrote about a few years ago about how some of the other programs have structured themselves with WGU in mind from a business model a bit and don't have the scale to do what WGU can do. So their pricing is off. And you know, I'm not saying there aren't other good programs, but most of them are pretty small. Um, but you know, I heard this phrase yesterday, uh, you know, there are waves and there are tides, and it feels to me like there's a much bigger thing going on with competency-based education, even than the big program and the other ones. Um, just that you have all of higher education and employers talking about competencies, which I'm no expert, but that seems like a big deal, a big shift. Yeah. And, um, you know, those are kind of the couple of the big pieces coming into what is, uh, we were discussing in the green room, um, we don't know when, but at some point, we will see Congress move on higher education, and uh, the White House has been keeping busy on it as well. So there's a lot going on, um, and a lot of that is obviously driven around uh, debt, ROI, and whether or not you're able to adequately serve this giant adult student population. Um, so j just a couple things, I know I'm rambling here. Um, you know, I think that traditional higher ed maybe underestimating the level of the backlash that is coming. Um, and, you know, it's hard to predict these things, but to me it feels like the social mobility data uh, showing that you know, the top 28 colleges in terms of selectivity enroll more people from the 1% of income than they do the bottom 60%. That's, uh, that's not good. And I think um, there's a growing awareness in Washington and in the general public that uh, tr traditional higher ed uh, has not served uh, lower income students as well as it could. And I think the varsity blues thing, uh, y'all, have you heard about this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it seems to have grabbed the general public uh, in ways that unfortunately uh, really make people feel like the deck 
is, is, uh, is rigged, that, that this is not a fair game in higher education. So you've got that, those, cont those pieces flowing as uh, Congress looks at how to assure better ensure accountability in higher education. And you know, one of the signs that seemed really interesting to us was Senator Chris Murphy, Democrat from Connecticut, a uh, longtime member of the Health and Education Committee, um, an aggressive critic of for-profits, came out the other day and said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna do it for everybody. Um, all higher education needs to, to be held accountable, so, so look out. Um, and so if you have you know, Democrats and Republicans agreeing that more needs to be done to hold colleges accountable for return on investment and value, uh, it, it seems like an interesting turn of events. And I think a lot of traditional higher ed felt like, you know, privately, very frustrated with the Obama administration because they felt, if you remember the ratings plan, you know, the, the initial idea was to tie federal aid eligibility to outcomes. Um, and that really scared traditional higher ed. And it turned out it's really hard to do. Um, but you know, that was not a flash in the pan. I think other Democrats will, will follow suit. And um, you know, the Trump administration is very soon going to be putting out program level data on how higher ed performs in terms of ROI across the board. And that'll be interesting to watch. But one quick other thing, the, um, you know, it's tough though to, to, when you just focus on jobs and income, you do lose something. And at this, this discussion I had yesterday, you know, uh, early child care, uh, home health aides, those don't look good on some outcomes measures, and you know they're really important professions. So it's going to be tough to kind of make some of these decisions much, much more, much harder in in, in actual practice than in theory. Uh, but it's coming. Thanks. I got to tell you, yeah. it's interesting. Well, yes, those things are happening in the government, and they're influencing it increasingly. Uh, employers are, are you going to be your customer? So this idea that you've got to appeal to some 17-year-old traditional student or their parents, that's going out the door. We are now paying the bill. And so I think CBE has a real chance because you're gonna have, I just hired someone full-time on our staff, for example, you know, a buck 35 a year to ensure that every employee who applies for tuition reimbursement comes here and makes the case. We review their school. And to be honest, we don't care if it's profit or for profit. We want, we look at, so we're less interested, you know, there's, I think there's a political narrative around for profits and, and, and non profits. We don't care about the status. Hell, we're in for profit business. So we'd be hard pressed to say we hate capitalists because <laughs> we make money. But um, so what we want to know is what are going to be the outcomes? Is it market aligned? And to the extent it is market aligned, you're getting these people through with some, we'll pay for it. I mean, we've long been in the business in, in corporate America of sending Harvard $60,000, $75,000 a year to put our hypos through an MBA program. So we'll invest $150,000, $200,000 all day for a high potential person. And at this point, given the low birth rate and, and all of the other things that are going low on employment rate, every employee is a hypo. Yeah. We have to mm -hmm. invest in every one. So what's fascinating now is people are, we're seeing educational institutions show up to our offices and say, what matters? to you, employer. I read something this morning in Forbes, and actually Brandon Busty wrote it, which says, which you're now, you just read the article this morning, it's really interesting that more and more parents are foregoing this traditional idea that you finish, that success is finishing high school and going immediately to college. Apple started it, all of the Silicon Valley companies, they're finding talent sort of like the MBA at 17 and say, you don't have to go to college, come to us. We'll begin your career and then pay for your degree along the way. And who do you think's making that decision? The consumer now is the employer, not the kid necessarily, or what we thought of as a kid, and surely not their parents. So I think you are seeing a total seismic shift, a paradigm shift in higher education. And I always hate higher education because that suggests that everything else is lower education. <laughs> so I say post-secondary. Yeah. But as an employer, we are looking critically at what you all are providing because we are having people show up who are angry. They've spent a ton of money and there was an implicit commitment or promise or contract that they were going to be better off uh, four, five, six years later with all of that debt. And it's not coming true for a lot of Americans. Yeah. 
Scott, Paul mentioned something briefly in his remarks around CBE and people understanding what it is, and this is your chance for myth busting. So what is the most common myth you hear about CBE or something you wish people knew about CBE as a model? Uh, there's probably two things. One is that CBE was designed so that you could go fast. <laughs> That's one. It's a complete fallacy. Second is, is that uh, somehow there's actually no courses in learning that you just assess, you know, you, uh, that all of it is just direct assessment. So it's a way to basically say you learn everywhere else or on your own and we're just going to assess you. That's not true either. Um, Competency-based education, in my opinion, really solves for two things. One, it solves for increasing the alignment between the education you're pursuing and the opportunities that you're pursuing. Um, and those, uh, if anything, the employer disruption that's occurring that Johnny referenced, it's, it's occurring because so much of the survey showed the employers basically had, you know, they rated graduates' readiness 30 to 40 percentage points below where the graduates and the institutions rated their readiness for the jobs they have. Hence, employers started investing tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of effectively doing training on top of the degree that the individuals already pursued. And so competency-based education, first and foremost, it's intended to design the development of curriculum that has learning outcomes that directly map to competencies required in the, in the uh, opportunities being pursued. The second thing that allows, it allows for time to be the variable, not the standard of learning. Hence, the personalization of learning is the second key thing that competency-based education solves for. That uh, anyone who's ever thought of the classroom you had, whether it was in high school or even in college, you realize that not everyone learned at the same pace, N not even everyone learned in the same way. Um, it became pretty evident to me that I even did math differently than some of my colleagues did, but it worked really well for me. Uh, and how, th how does the traditional model solve for that? Well, those who can learn and learn really well, guess what they get? They get an A. And those who learn moderately well get a B, and those who learn less moderately well get C's and D's, and someone joked D is for degree. You're like, you know, so um, those, that's, that model basically says within a fixed amount of time, all those who actually, you, that's all you have, and those who learn the most get the A's, those who don't learn, and that doesn't work for uh, improving the outcomes for all the different individual learning types. If you let time be the variable, and you hold the standards for learning constant, then you actually hold to the belief that everyone can actually achieve those standards, but they're gonna do so at the, at the personalized path and pace that's appropriate for them. But once they're competent, then you actually have the, you know, the individual that you need. And so that's the, con the notion of competency-based education is really about personalization and alignment so that the educational workforce link works as well as for every individual to be successful. Great, thanks. Paul, you mentioned briefly this issue of how we measure the outcome of a college degree, and obviously we have a series of outcomes we use here at Gallup. Other research firms use other outcomes. Um, other individual university partners use other outcomes. If there was one outcome that you could say, this is the thing I would change about how we measure the value of a college degree today, what out one outcome do you wish most universities focused on? Uh, that's a tough one. I'm waiting. I'm writing yeah, down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I'm a journalist, so I'm unbiased, um, so I'm going to duck that to some extent. But I do, I do think it's kind of amazing how little we, we know, just period. I mean, that uh, we don't have program level data accessible to students about what you can expect in terms of employment outcomes. Um, you know, many do that, but uh, that data doesn't exist. I mean, we all know that the the student unit record, the federal government bans the collecting of that information. So. Uh, I suspect at some point that will change, but that would open up the doors to knowing a lot more about what actually happens to graduates in the labor market. Um, and, you know, and I think another thing, um, it's, uh, uh, we are still, as an industry, haven't really made as much progress on measuring learning or how to do that, how to assess it. WGU does some assessments, um, but I think uh, that to, to get better in a way that the industry writ large used um, to actually try to measure learning in meaningful ways that uh, are beyond the grade um, would be helpful. But you know, there are, that's a tough issue. There are many, I would, I, I bet uh, that most of the readers of Inside Higher Ed are skeptical of the concept of learning outcomes. Um, you know, uh, Bob Sherman, uh, formerly of the Obama administration, um, very important person in higher education, called it mindless bean counting. Um, so there's not, it's, it's hard to even say in a lot of circles whether we should try, but I, I think that um, 
that, that uh, would be an area that I would be very interested to see if more could be done. Is that diplomatic enough? Yeah, great, <laughs> great answer. Well, I, if I could just jump in on this point, one thing I know uh, will get disrupted, which is uh, using exclusivity or selectivity as a measure of quality. Um, uh, but that is very much still an undertone that exists in higher education that, uh, that depending on the brand that's on the credential you, uh, you receive, uh, signals to some degree the quality of that learning. Um, but I think even with the Varsity Blue stuff, there was a great editorial about this that highlighted that the, the gains in the ROI for those that were pursuing, if you will, an Ivy League degree were not actually very good for those who already had the social capital to pursue the jobs they had. So the ROI was really low for the, most of those who were consuming it, but it was really high for those that came from the low-income households that then could go to those selective institutions or like dramatic uh, return on investment, but it was mostly related to the social capital. It was not related to what could be measures of learning. And the challenge with that is I often say the selectivity of an institution often tells you more about the individual than, they do, than it does about the institution. Um, so I think there are ways that you can definitely assess, if you will, readiness uh, as individuals are coming in, and then you can surely assess learning outcomes at the tail end of that, and like, was there progress in the, read in the readiness or the learning of that specific individual? Uh, but what we do know is there are also better measures of ROI. Um, at the end of the day, I think what the federal government is doing and what everyone else is trying to do is uh, how do you underwrite the investment that we expect individuals to make in their post-secondary education so they can lead to a great opportunity? We do know how to measure opportunity. It's, it's, it's like this Gallup stuff. It's income gains, it's job, it's overall well-being, it's engagement rates. Like, like how, what's, that's the measures of return. Great, so how much is the investment to, to, to drive that return? What I do know is this, is that the return is rising at a much lower rate than this one is. Mm -hmm. And at some point, if that gets upside down, you're like, you're, it's totally right for a massive disruption, so. Johnny, um, you sit in an employer's point of view, and it's an important perspective for higher education more generally. One of the findings that we had in the study was that those who said that their coursework was highly related to the current work that they do were far more engaged in their work. They were also far more likely to strongly agree that their degree was valuable. We see this in all of our national research um, and also with WGU graduates specifically. So from your perspective, you know how we measure engagement and work and you know a lot about our metrics around that. How do you see that play out from an employer's point of view? You know, we are in, <coughs> I was just in Dubai and they have a minister of happiness. <laughs> and at first I was like, what a weird, I mean like our equivalent of a secretary, they have a minister of happiness. And I thought it was a weird term. Uh, but I began to understand it as I, you know, got past the title, the words, nomenclature, and uh, we're increasingly trying to figure out how can we get engagement up within our organization. So it's not enough to hire the brightest, most talented person if you can't keep them. Or if you can keep them, they're a jerk, and so they run everybody else away. So, you know, in the process, you know, the brilliant engineer who no one wants to work with. So engagement is such an incredibly important part in terms of measurement for us, how people tend to work in teams. We're looking, you know, increasingly now, creativity, agility, adaptability are the skills that we, and the characteristics that we value in the workplace. Tying this though to, to sort of what we found is that employers, employees who come into the organization who are engaged because they feel like what they studied matters, which means they can immediately uh, make a contribution to the organization, come in with frankly a better attitude. They're just easier for us to manage, they're easy, they're you know, less high maintenance, not as high a maintenance as others. It's just, it really makes for a better overall environment and as soft as it sounds, they make for a happier place to work. And we are all pursuing this, that, that word. Again, I struggle with it because it feels, you know, as a lawyer, fairly corny, <laughs> but it really does matter. When you ask people why do they come to work, Money's up there, but once you hit a certain level of this, I can, tell, I can serve my debt, put a little money to the side, service my debt, put some money to the side, and live a moderately good life, everything above that is purpose and all of those sorts of things, and do I like coming to work? So that's why it's so important to us in and of itself is we need people who come in and they're not distracted with, I've got to get a second job to make ends meet. 
we see a lot of that. So, you know, literally, I was in a meeting with someone. I called the meeting. Now, CEO calls the meeting at 4 o'clock. This woman has a hard stop at 5 because she has to be at her second job by 5.30. And can you imagine me sitting in my meeting? I kept seeing her look at her clock at about 4.45. I'm like, what the hell is going on with her? <laughs> like, right? This is the boss. And I put this on her schedule like two weeks before, before, ahead of time. Ultimately, I took, I was really a, sort of assertive with her because I was bothered that she appeared to be paying attention to the time. She came back and gave me the story. She said, I have to work a second job to pay my student loans. And so that job starts at 5.30. I have to be there from 5.30 to 9.30. And it really made, it, it crystallized for me how much this matters. It's helpful. I have a follow-up to that. Um, what does a strong employer-university partnership look like? Because we have a lot of university partners that we work with that want to understand how they can get better internship opportunities for their students. What does a great university partner look like in terms of how they interact with an employer like you all? So market aligned, I love the phrase. Uh, but we also, we're not naive. We know, especially in post-secondary, higher education in particular, um, you know, you're not vocational schools. I mean, to reduce everything you do down to, can the person do this particular task? Well, part of the problem with that is the task that you're training them for now, that job might not even exist five years from now. So if you're truly just train, training to a job, you're missing the mark. We want people who can read, who can think, who are curious, who are smart about other things. You know, you can teach a lab rat if ultimately if you just repeat it over and over and over, right? So we know that a good partnership says yes, we need them to leave with a certain skill. We need people to do this job, and, and we need to make sure that they can do it. But we also want people who are more broad than that. So it is important that, you know, yes, market alignment, job readiness, all of that good stuff, but we want a whole person. Ultimately, though, because we're looking for leaders. Someone's got to lead these organizations. It's fine to have a whole bunch of people sort of running in the business, but you ultimately have to build a leadership team. So leadership skills, and it'd be interesting, I wanted to ask Scott about that. With a totally virtual campus and all online, how do you get those things that do come out of a residential college experience, you know, how to interact? Because teamwork's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Again, people come in who've not had to, I can sit in my house and go online and do everything that I do, how do I develop those people's skills? How do I convince others to follow me? Where does that come from? How do you deal with uh, in the workplace clashes? So that's the yeah. real university <laughs> partnership is about making sure that you produce whole good citizens for us who actually can do a job. By the way, that does help. Yeah. I think what you're talking about too is the combination of what are uh, maybe Specific trade skills, if you will, regardless of what that trade is, finance, marketing, you know, human resources, um, and it could be technical trade skills, you know, software development, et cetera. Th those are skill categories. But then there are also those, um, you know, human skills, if you will, those that have a lifetime of a shelf life versus the other type of trade skills often have a shelf life that's two to seven years. You could particularly see that in technology where, a, you know, a software language will a coding language to get replaced, you know, every three to seven years or so, and um, and it is critical that uh, higher education and the post-secondary programs that exist. They have to solve for both, because those that are in those human skills, they we are trying to redefine that even as power skills or enduring skills, where most people call them soft skills. You're like, there's nothing soft about them. They're actually your most enduring skill set. To, and if anything, they signal two things. One is you have really the ability to reason and to tackle new problems. You know, humans are really good in dealing with ambiguity because they start to problem solve. The second thing is you know how to actually engage others to, to basically put work and effort against that. So in that particular regard, even in our programs, even though we're 100% online, we integrate practicum into our programs. And practicum is basically experiential learning that's part of the design curriculum. Um, the most obvious ones for us are in your licensure programs in health as well as in teaching, but we're also addressing that in uh, advancing our design into technology-enabled programs, business programs, et cetera, where you actually have to apply the learning into an actual context, and then your performance in that context is also being assessed by our network of coaches in the, teachers, uh, in the teacher segments in the schools and school districts, or by certified coaches in nursing and other practicum areas like medical coding is one of those that has clinical hours and rotations to it. So even though we're a virtual you know, university, not all the part of the program is virtual. And so not everything they can do is online. 
Now there's another way in which we're also addressing it. Social emotional learning, a lot of what we're doing in our academy and the curriculum there, we learn by developing our own curriculum that increases abilities, capacity for learning. Uh, it specifically addressed communications, it addressed self-efficacy, and so we designed a curriculum that was adapted from a, you know, one of the leading uh, developers of this, called Di his name is Diego Navarra, uh, and it specifically helped people understand their approach to learning, their approach to communication and everything else, and so our design of that course, you're, you as a student are in a cohort with 19 other students, so you're a 20 student cohort, this is the one case where we actually have synchronous sessions. So for a four week period, you have to participate in two sessions a week with those other 19 <coughs> peers. And uh, it's specifically because of the communication that you have to have with others. There's another big uh, impact it has, this notion of hyperbonding. Hyperbonding occurs when you see other people eye to eye. And it only happens when you see people eye to eye because you all of a sudden as a human develop a connection with another human that you actually develop personal obligation. They're no longer foreign to you. They're no longer like in Twitterverse where I could just blast everybody and call them all sorts of offensive <coughs> things because now I see the other person. I see that they are human like me. I see that in fact they're obligated to me the same way I'm obligated to them and guess what it does? It raises my personal expectations for my behaviors and commitments and follow through on all the learning I'm supposed to do. This is vitally important to a lot of your dynamics that you also exist in the workplace. It's like we are not just faceless names that have some anonymous, you know, handle out there on Twitter or otherwise. We actually are individuals that care deeply about one another. And so that can be, you know, we often think about the, a lot of what can occur in a classroom can be replicated online, not all of it. But we also do think about how to utilize physical to augment the virtual versus most who have physical are utilizing virtual to augment that. You know, and so we're kind of going the other way. Um, and so we'll see. I, I'm excited about things that we can even explore by using WeWork spaces to actually have student meetups and that are all in online courses because this can expand it. There, I think there's a lot of uh, innovation still to be had around, and that's why the Center for Applied Learning Science is also advancing it. Stephanie, I had one other oh. comment. In, you term, talk about the sort of ideal relationship. One of the things that we are saying to employer, uh, to institutions, uh, colleges and universities that come to visit with us is, one thing that you can do is help us, and it's a Gallup word, help your students identify their strengths. Um, and you don't think about it as a responsibility of the school, but if you tell a student, and we see this all the time, the highest paying jobs are now computer programming. So all of the kids run off and think that's what I should go major in. And that may not play to their strengths. And many of them could get through the program just by sure determination and tenacity, and they get through it, but that's not the great future employee for us. So if one of the things that we think you could factor in is helping educate a student in their strength. You're not ignoring their weaknesses, but if you spend all of your time focused on the weaknesses, then you know, you're know you totally not taking advantage of the, the individual's natural strengths. They could be superstars as opposed to decent programmers, or they could be a superstar finance person or an HR person. So anything that would allow early on in the intake process to help students identify what is your strength, and then we will educate the heck out of you on your strengths so that you really show up, that's an engagement thing, and then that's a great deliverable for us. So that I would just add that, and again, sounds like a little bit of a commercial since we're sitting in Gallup's and they're big on Gallup strength, and okay, it is, but, uh, but it really does matter. We're so, I've seen students make decisions about law school because they read that the average lawyer makes X. They're not going to be particularly good at it, and I hate to say, and you're not going to make that dollar. <laughs> you know, you kind of want to help them. And then the other thing that that we that drives me nuts is when, and I'm sorry if I offend anyone in this room, I probably will, but this idea that you say to someone, you can be anything you want to be. That's just, I mean, come on. I want to play in the NBA, Got it. you know, and wanted to, and tried to hire the best tutors. I actually knew Steph Curry's dad. He, but Steph turned out I didn't. I mean, it just wasn't ever going to work out for me. But, but we really would do better. That that worries us because then they show up in the workplace believing that craziness. It's like I'm not your mom. I don't believe that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this ain't good. You're not good at this. <laughs> and uh, but it would help us uh, being a little tongue in cheek about it. But seriously, a focus on early on helping people figure out what they can be great at, their strengths, 
and then educating them to that would be huge. Yeah. It was funny because a few weeks ago we were sitting here with a one, another university partner of ours, Bates College, who recently did this study around purpose and work and how you could propel students to find purposeful work. And one of the main findings from that study was that students who had realistic expectations about what they could achieve upon graduation were actually far more likely to find purpose in their work. And for good reason, because we heard over and over again qualitative excerpts from our focus groups where students said, well, it's great that my professors believed in me and they told me I could be anything I wanted to be and I could achieve all these things, but I achieved none of them. And I'm really mad about it, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> not only do they suffer in their workplace, they also attribute their university to that false expectation, so they will hold it against their institution of record. So it's not just your gut, there's data. Um, I have a question for you, Paul. You know, we talked a lot about different experiences that happen while a student is enrolled, um, whether it be finding their strengths or an internship experience, a mentorship experience. From the many universities that you study, from where you sit at Inside Higher Ed, what one experience do you feel like needs to be more properly scaled across institutions to better prepare students for success? That's a good one. I was thinking about the, the findings in, in the research today about the role of the mentor, and I, you know, I know Gallup has done a lot on that. Um, you know, uh, if anything, probably even undervaluing still how much it matters to have that individual who's who works with you throughout your academic journey, who cares about you. You know, it's. Other colleges are waking up to that. Um, but it really clicked for me, so, so uh, this is gonna sound like a side note, but a few years ago I did a panel, I uh, moderated a panel with Scott and uh, Mitch Daniels from Purdue right. yeah. uh, in front of a room full of education reporters. It was not as nice of a room. Um, <laughs> but uh, we were a little concerned, you know, it's Mitch Daniels and Purdue's doing some cool stuff, just like WGU, that, that he would get a lot of the questions. And it turned out, I think every question but one was about your faculty your unbundled faculty model. And that to me was really telling that, you know, it's so different. Why don't others do that? You know, I know it's not easy. Um, but a few years back, even before that, I went to go see a math emporium at Montgomery College. And you now that's, as most of you know, uh, dev ed, development education is really the black hole of American higher education. Very few students escape it when assigned to a, dev a developmental education course. They have to pay for it, they don't get credit for it, it's very discouraging, et cetera. So this at Montgomery College, they, they, broke, they unbundled the faculty role, uh, and they weren't the ones who invented this, Virginia Tech did it first, others. But for remedial ed, dev ed, um, students would work in a big room, Austin College does this really cool, at, it's Texas, so it's big scale, it's a gi gigantic room, like many hundreds of students. And the faculty members kind of rove around, and they actually, it's like a universal thing. They use keg cups, red and blue, right? And like you put the red cup up on top if you need help, or I think blue if you're doing an assessment. And the faculty members kind of move through and help students have breakthroughs. They teach them individually how to master concepts, you know? And there's not a lecture, and you know, so a lot of the things that, that you think about a professor doing, this is not that. Um, and I talked to a few professors who were doing this who said, you know, it's not what I really got my PhD for. I wasn't sure that, you know, when we first, but I love it and never go back. Like this is, this is working and this is great and it's a challenge and it's, it's a different way of looking at teaching. And I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of places are doing things like that. Any generalization about higher ed is, is fraught. Um, there's a lot of exciting experiments, but I, I, one I'm not, I haven't written about yet, so I can't tell you the school, but a, a big community college that does great work, basically looked at WGU and others and decided to try to do a, a scalable pilot um, where the student is assigned a faculty mentor throughout. And it, that, that feels like where it's doable that more places should try that. That's encouraging, yeah. <laughs> uh, one of those things that, uh, to, your, to Paul's point, you can tend to overgeneralize about higher education and the faculty model, but uh, what I do know is, is that uh, many of the faculty assessment, meaning those that are the best faculty, et cetera, have little to do with student outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that is one thing that you could start to change the dynamic around faculty and the roles they have is if, in fact, the individuals who are paying to come to get the education, et cetera, if the outcomes are more related to how successful you are in helping those students get to where they actually want to be, and that becomes the measures of you know, faculty success, then it's very different. Now, 
Having said that, I have a general opinion that there are two roles of higher education generally, uh, which is one is to advance knowledge, and that's research. The other one is to transfer knowledge, which is teaching. Um, because of, I think, a lot of history around mostly uh, physical locations, everything else of the population, is that we tend to uh, historically have designed service areas, that you had to plunk down colleges to make service areas uh, so that then individuals to be served in that area had access to the campus. But because that service area was rather constrained, because you didn't have the internet, you couldn't travel tons of miles, et cetera, you ended up with thousands of institutions basically becoming a cookie cutter approach to trying to blend research and teaching. And so then you get the faculty model replicated across all those institutions, and the measures of faculty success and advancement and everything else all became replicated across all those institutions, when in fact now, when we have a rather expansive internet-enabled way to access high-quality education, maybe not all of those institutions should be doing the same thing. And maybe we should be thinking differently about the measures of uh, you know, faculty engagement and the measures of student outcomes as the success of faculty. Um, we are not confused at WGU as to what our primary purpose is. Our primary purpose is to help students achieve uh, and help those graduates get great outcomes. Um, the design of the faculty model was absolutely unique in its day. Uh, kudos to Bob Mendenhall in figuring out how to, how to do that because that wasn't always the case even at WGU. I think. You know, if I think now years, it was probably about 12 years ago when we kind of unpacked that role and all of a sudden said, it's not just about teaching and being a subject matter expert, whether it's at the major, at the program level, or at a course, it's not just about teaching. Because if you look at the students that we're serving, the reasons they stopped out before had little to do with cognition. Right. You had to deal with life. You had to deal with, I struggle to even figure out how to pay for this. I have to work two jobs. I have children. I don't have the time to spend, like, so how did we start adapting the university and the program to that student, rather than forcing the individual student to adapt their life to how the education was gonna be uh, packaged and standardized? And so that faculty mentor role became vitally important. It is a program faculty, meaning it is a master's degree or higher in the field of study. So that's like, I have an MBA, I have you know, many years of industry experience to that. I could absolutely mentor others who are pursuing an MBA because I still know a lot of marketing and finance and organizational behavior that you can mentor and provide a lot of integrated instruction, but I also care about all the other things going on in your life because those are the ones getting in the way of you doing your studies. And I always love to highlight just one example that I'll end with on this point is when we had the hurricanes come through in 2017, we had about 11,000 students impacted by Hurricane Harvey and Irma. The first person they call isn't a student support center. Guess who they call? They call their mentor. This is where I am. This is what's going on. I, my home's trash. I have no internet access. I'm trying to figure out how to do it. They call their faculty mentor. They don't call a student support center. And I think it's increasingly important that even campus-based institutions or, or classroom-based learning, they have to consider what they're doing around this because if you look just at the data, 25 to 35, 25 to 30 percent of the adolescents who are in higher ed today, they're so stressed out, so much anxiety, so much depression, so many other things are going on, they're impacting their learning, and you have ill-equipped individuals, faculty, to deal with it, and mostly what they bolt on is the advising service that has a ratio of about 1,000 students to one. Our program mentors, somewhere between 65 and 90. You know, How often does a mentor interact with a student throughout any given term? Typically once a week. Okay. Typically once a week. In all that OIG research, by the way, we discovered that a student at WGU, in a course of a six-month term, will interact with faculty somewhere between 90 and 120 times. I'm like, I don't even think that was true for my entire undergraduate degree. You're like, you know, if you count lectures, maybe, but, uh, you know, if I went. Um, but, you know, 90 to 120 times every term. And that was with your program mentor, your course faculty, and evaluation faculty, whomever it may be. So uh, it is highly regular, but it's also variable, because I don't need the same level of engagement on every course. So. Tony, I saw you nodding at one point and you took a note. 
No, I, I, I wrote down the Montgomery College thing. I want to know about this, you big, want the cups? this big room full of people. I want yeah. them in the cups, right? Yeah. But no, that was just notable. Awesome. Well, we will wrap it there and then take your good questions. I think there are mics running around, so feel free to just pop your hand up as you have a question. We even have, I think, some questions coming in from Twitter and otherwise. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Are they anonymous? <laughs> I, I'm just curious. I, I heard your statistic on the uh, 65 to 90. And, and if I'm doing the math. You have 100,000 plus. So you have staff of, what, thirteen to 1,500? Is our that staff or part-time staff? How do you cover that number? That's, uh, we do. Uh, so our total university has about 6,200 employees, of which... Uh, I would, uh, I think we, 700 of those are part-time, uh, 700, and the only part-time faculty that we have are in the evaluation faculty, but all of our, all of our curriculum faculty, those who design and develop the curriculum, and all of our faculty program mentors and the faculty course instructors, they're all full-time. Uh, of our 60 to 100, I think our faculty are 42, 4,300 of that. Um, and that is our, you know, that one pretty much is a linear today, a linear scaling number. So as you add, you know, X number of students, you add the same number of faculty today. Um, so that's, uh, we're currently, I think, adding about a net 100 new employees a month, of which 60 to 65 are faculty. I got, I got this from the WGU team last night over dinner, but can you share the total number of enrollments each month that you have on average? The last year, so our fiscal year uh, will end June 30th of this year, and so uh, this year we'll enroll somewhere around uh, 72,000 new students, so it averages about 6,000 a month, but we've been as high as 8,000 every month. We have terms starting the first of every month. I did want to ask you a question on your number of 50% graduation rate. Yeah. How do you define it? I mean, the traditional institutions have to deal with cohorts and defining it that way, and we know it's fraught yeah. with problems, but how is that five, six years, and if people... Yeah, so we do use similar graduation rates today. Basically, you're two and three year for graduates, and then we use our four and six year for undergraduate. Um, we're moving away from that, meaning we're moving towards a personalized on-time grad rate based upon how many credits you're transferring in and if you maintain your on-time pace, how many terms should you complete in and what percentage of our students are completing their graduation on, or graduating on time. Uh, for federal reporting purposes, we report four-year and six-year grad rates. Um, I will say we're clearly endeavoring to you know, achieve 50%. Uh, that, that number, I think, is our f overall attainment rate. It's like 51, 52 now. So, um, we're trying to drive our four-year completion rate for undergraduate north of 50% by 2025, which would put us at, uh, well above the sector average. We're, we're today about 42% for four-year grad rate, and the six-year grad rate will catch up to that improvements. We have to wait some time. It's one of those funny things with four and six-year. But six years is a weird thing, by the way. It's like basically saying something that costs $100 will give you 150. <laughs> And that's how it works. Um, and today, like the average time to complete for most in, in traditional campuses is over five years. Yeah. It's expensive. Uh, my name's Steve Crawford. I'm at George Washington University. And this won't surprise Paul, but my question is about the credentials the WGU awards. In, I, I'm aware of the, the degrees, but it strikes me that in IT and in healthcare, there are a lot of non-degree credentials. Interestingly, one sec sector, healthcare, is highly regulated, and IT sort of the Wild West. But there are a lot of non-degree credentials, certifications, certificates, boot camps out there trying to provide some of these. How does WGU integrate, if it does, how does it integrate? I know you're doing some licensing, but certifications and certificates into your curriculum. Yeah, it's a great question. today. We uh, fully embed certifications into our degree programs. So if you graduate, for example, with a bachelor's in cybersecurity, that will come with seven industry certifications in it because we've integrated the assessments into the curriculum uh, design itself. So uh, that, for example, uh, will come with your NICE certification, your NSA certification, your EC Council certs, et cetera. Similarly, we have that in computer science and, and network operations. But you can do the same. We do the same in the healthcare space, et cetera. We're mostly an embed model today because we are primarily offering or granting bachelor's and master's degrees. But our future is, uh, I kind of use the term of, our future is independent but stackable. 
So that uh, the first one being that uh, partnership in California where the sub-degree credential of a medical coder will be fully stackable into the uh, degrees subsequently so that you can unbundle the, the truly market valued uh, credentials. You can uh, unbundle them from the degree whereas today where you fully embed them in the degree. Paul, so just real quick, yeah, uh, you know, I was taking notes on that new development because I feel like that's definitely a news story, mm -hmm. you know, but the uh, working with the two unions with the employers to design custom non-degree credentials seems to be a real area of potential disruptive innovation in higher education to your point of the importance of the employers. I mean, the employers are getting much more engaged in uh, post-secondary education and uh, to Steve knows I'm interested in this, but the uh, if you all haven't looked at the Google IT certificate, I recommend it. Uh, it's an eight-month program, fully online, designed and taught by Google, and now offered through partnerships with, I think they said up to 100 community colleges now. So that's an extreme example, but employers are going to do it themselves uh, if colleges don't join them in doing it. Yes. My name's Peter Smith, I'm at University of Maryland, University College, and Scott, I think you've undersold yourself a little bit. Uh, the, <clears throat> you said advanced knowledge, transfer knowledge, but you also just said you recognize knowledge that's already gained. And, and I think that's gonna be an increasingly big part of what we do as educators, and that's one I'd love to hear you just think out loud about that a little bit. And the second is competency-based education, again, uh, you were talking about it in a wonderful way, but the people skills, the power skills, as you call them, which I love, can be built in to the assessments. Oh, yeah. so, so the point of the matter is we're so used to thinking that's just an extra thing you sort of get, right. uh, when in fact, depending on how you ask someone to assess or to do a project or to show what they know, you can, you can build those power skills into the assessment and quantify the, the ability to harness them in particular situations. And I'd be inter interested in just hearing you talk a little bit about those things, because I think it dramatically even further strengthens uh, evidence-based or competency-based, whatever we want to call it, yeah. assessments. Yeah, um, uh, so taking those two points, uh, let me take the second one uh, first, because you're absolutely right, which is, um, uh, liberal education uh, or general education, you know, like those things that truly develop critical reasoning, the uh, you know, analytical horsepower, problem solving skills, communication, et cetera, that's fully integrated into our programs. And, and I always, uh, you will see me smile my, if I'm ever on a panel with someone who says CB doesn't work for liberal arts. I was like, mm hmm, yeah, and you can't give grades either in liberal arts, apparently. You know, so, uh, the skill set that's associated with those power and enduring skills is like it can be assessed too. And so we fully integrate that liberal education into our programs today. Um, uh, we are specifically developing those interdisciplinary studies that are very relevant again to the workforce too. Uh, because it is different, you know, art history is like what are the learning outcomes from art history that are relevant to the opportunities that you're pursuing. Uh, and there's great data from Burning Glass and others that show if you also attach certain skill-based learning on top of liberal arts, it will dramatically increase their readiness for the first job, which is so much of the challenge of having just a straight liberal arts education too. And so that is, you can absolutely assess liberal education, the competencies around that. You have to be really good at designing and, and defining what those competencies are. They can be mapped very well to what the employers need and you can assess them. To your first point is, uh, I think you made a great point. Now I'm gonna have three points, which is advancing knowledge, you know, tra transferring it and recognizing it. Um, WGU does have a number of partnerships today with uh, community colleges, with ACE, with uh, military, et cetera, to where as a competency-based model, uh, you rely heavily upon the design and the uh, delivery of assessments. Assessments is really about validating learning outcomes. Uh, when we can validate those learning outcomes in learning, uh, from learning contexts that we didn't deliver, it increases the value of a competency-based model. And so that includes uh, our engagements and partnering with coding boot camps. Coding boot camps are delivering great education that's directly relevant to jobs. The problem is, is that there's no credit attached to it that makes it portable or transferable into degree-seeking pathways. So you'd have to start over if you want to go pursue a bachelor's degree. Um, uh, now, if you came to WGU, you could accelerate really quickly through those courses that are relevant to what you learn, or 
you can just validate and assess those learning outcomes and now they become uh, portable credit or transferable credit. We are the largest consumer of American Council on Education's credits. We also can include in that employer provided training and outcomes too. And so uh, it is recognizing and validating learning and then attaching transferable credit to it uh, really moves us away from a uh, institutional owned transcript to a credential and learning wallet that's owned by the individual. Other questions? Well, thank you for your time today. Uh, I had one question. If you could design the one thing, this is for each of you on the panel, the one thing that you believe stands in the way of you achieving the goal for 2030, Amazon 2030 universities here, Apple's in the education business, Google's in the education business, and you had to remove one obstacle that you believe is in your way to get to that vision that you have for your, your field, what would that be? Good question. That's a great question. We'll let Johnny go first. <laughs> <laughs> gracious of you, Mr. President. <laughs> um, it's, it's the cost factor. It's the affordability. And, you know, it's, it's going to become the issue next year for sure in this, it's already become the issue in the 2020 election, is whether it's free. I, I don't think, the question is not whether it's free, education is free, it's who's paying for it. So this idea of free is just absurd to me. Um, it's nothing's free. Um, but we do have to figure out how to uh, make this accessible. You know, accessibility sometimes, if you're in the disabled community, it's about getting in. If it's in the past, it was race and gender and other forms. But now I think the new accessibility is affordability and figuring out how to make it. Um, we've sort of allowed people to take on ridiculous amounts of loans, and that gives you the perception that it's accessible, but then it destroys the rest of your life. And I can tell you from the employer perspective, it matters to us. As I said, people are working second jobs, they're generally unhappy. You give them everything and they're still unhappy. Uh, and that's because fundamentally, they are financially insecure. And people who are financially insecure have a really hard time making all being happy. And uh, so I think if we could figure that out, I don't think the answer is to suggest that education is free, because it is not free but we do have to find a way. And I also don't think it's necessarily, it's a little, in my opinion, sort of a dated model to look at, you know, your parents' fast perform and things like that. I think, first of all, you know, students are older and it's just, and if you truly believe in lifelong learning, what about the 35 year old who did get a college degree 20 years ago, but it now has to reskill, then where do you go? So I just think all together we've got to rethink um, accessibility from a financial perspective. And I don't know what that means. I'm not smart enough. Paul will have the answer. Oh, no. I can tell you what I'd remove. That was your question, right? Well, I was going to cite you, actually, for my answer. Um, you know, I, it's a great question. I, I feel like I was thinking about what Johnny said on knowing more about what student skills are at intake and building on them throughout. I, I just heard about a, a major public university system that is going to start focusing more on that orientation. And you're not talking about the rich kids at the residential campus. I'm talking about orientation for working adult students. Um, don't really do much of that in higher education in a, in a meaningful way. And it, that's about resources, partially. But to, to better have an understanding of who the student is, what their interests are, what their skills are, and then show them a tangible career path. Like that, that seems to be where a lot of the problems flow from. And WGU does this well, and others do too. But I get the sense that as we move, you know, if you all heard about the demographic cliff that's coming for higher education, um, you know, fewer students in the next couple of years after a little bump, like 15 percentage point declines. And then, um, you know, fewer prepared students, fewer students who are able to pay uh, high tuition levels, who have uh, college educated family members. So how are you going to actually serve these students? And I worry sometimes that, uh, you know, employers, colleges, everyone involved, policymakers, the media, <laughs> is underestimating the scale of that challenge. Yeah. The, uh, uh, mostly in response to your question, I've been really thinking about what do we envision as the future state? Um, and there are two things I think about. One is 
we are moving away from a one and done model of higher education to a lifelong learning loop. Uh, unfortunately, in that model, there's so, in that future state, there is no one thing that's the biggest blocker. Uh, there is probably one thing that I think is critical to it, but, uh, but there's no one thing that's a blocker. One thing that I think is critical to it is uh, reliable, accessible information about what pathways lead to which opportunities and how do those then create stackable, lifelong learning pathways that adults can pursue. But if I think about all the other things that have to change on top of that, like, well, the entire federal financial aid model is going to have to change. Employer recruiting practices are going to have to change. The educational institutions are going to have to change. You're like, the, you know, the individual students' you know, perception of it's going to have to change of how learning occurs. Like, all of, if you think of the psyche around a four-year degree, you're like, uh, there is no four-year degree. You know, that's a huge problem. But the other thing that I think is in the future and this is where it's a much tougher problem, is we have 20 million adults in the higher ed system today. That is not sustainable for the US economy. You actually need somewhere around 30 million adults in the higher ed system. That incremental 10 million is gonna come from populations that have historically not performed very poorly because the systems weren't designed for their needs and their, and their you know, life situations, everything else like that. Johnny hit on a big part of that is affordability. Um, but I think even beyond affordability, uh, even if you tripled the Pell Grant options, everything else, employers made a huge investment there. That will only solve one aspect related to the success of the underrepresented and underserved populations. Um, and that's going to require complete reinvention of institutions uh, that no institution I've met other than WG is willing to do um, because they're optimizing their current model. They, the one uh, somewhat in jest joke I made today is just go look at the capital campaigns that have been oversubscribed over the last 10 years. Well, guess what that capital's going to? Building new buildings or tearing down existing ones and building a new one in its place. You're like, I worry a lot about that. Um, I worry a lot about it because it doesn't seem to me like it's increasing capacity of the system that needs to access you know, the 40 to 50 million adults that today are not at all being served by the you know, system. And so, that one, I wish I had the answer as to what's the biggest blocker to doing it. I do know that we have to rethink the learning pathway to help them be successful. I, I will say the one thing I hope we don't, and I know we do it a little, you know, little snide comments about, you know, residential private schools. The one thing that's beautiful about the American higher ed model is that there are choices. I think there are still absolutely places for high-end, small, um, you know, residential colleges that provide, you know, Colby College. And, and so I think we, we run the risk as an industry of correcting and says, we got to solve for that 30 million and everybody's got to be a new WGU. And I think what has happened, and, and it used to be just the opposite, those schools said, oh, online, poo poo, those aren't real degrees. I mean, so for a long time we did, but I think what we've got to do is appreciate the diversity. Uh, that is the American higher education model, which says there are going to be, I mean, I did my undergraduate work at the University of Miami, and there are going to be $70,000 a year high-end schools where kids want to go and should go. Mm -hmm. George Washington University, you just took our provost. He's now the president at GW. There, these things, um, there's, there's a place for that. And so what we've got to do is, as a federal, from a federal policy standpoint, is look at it. If we need 30 million people, then there should be different, you know, there's going to be a significant number who go to a WGU, there are going to be the kids who go to Harvard, there are going to be the kids that go to huge state institutions. Maryland has done a nice job of figuring out how UMBC plays in it. That's what we, UMUC, right. Um, that is, that's what we've got to do. So I just hope we don't overcorrect that all of these other people are bad and they're only for rich kids. Because frankly, one of the things that I know that, that we want is we don't want to end up with what we ran away from, which is there's this, the elite schools don't look like people like me. You know, if right. you convince this entire population, then, then you say, oh, but Harvard didn't have any diversity. Well, hell, because you talked them all into going to every other school because yeah. you badmouthed them. <laughs> you know, they should, we should appreciate the diversity that is the higher education community in America because it is unique. And uh, while not perfect, it's a pretty damn good system on balance. Everyone else wants to be it. <laughs> Yeah. That is a good place to wrap. We're going to wrap for time, but these folks will be available for questions and answers afterwards. So thank you so much for coming, and thank you to our panelists. Yeah.